OC World is made possible by the generous contributions of the Marisla Foundation, the Keith and Judy Swain Family Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to OC World. I'm your host, June Kim Lopez. At OC World, we consider ourselves to be the people's journalists, reaching 15 million homes and businesses throughout Southern California, covering critical issues with focus on people and their stories. As a nonprofit multimedia company working in partnership with KLCS, we are committed and accountable to you, our viewers. Our programming is diverse because every story needs to be told in its own unique, powerful way. From field reporting to in-studio interviews and documentary shorts, we aim to challenge your mind, compel your heart, and inspire civic duty. We want to hear from you because we want this to be a long-term relationship that makes positive impacts in our communities. And for our inaugural show, we are honored to have Rick Reeve, a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and an award-winning PBS TV icon and longtime editor of the Orange County Business Journal. For me, what stands out most about Rick is his kindness and purposeful contribution to all Southern Californians. Welcome, Rick, to OC World. Well, thank you, June. Great to, great to be here. Thank you for the nice introduction and congratulations on this, uh, this new show. Thank you so much. So how's it feel to be pulled out of retirement back under the limelights to join us at OC World? Well, you didn't, you didn't have to pull that hard, you know. <laughs> kind I, of. I, uh, it's, it's not like I've gone away entirely. I'm just, let's say I'm semi-retired. Okay. okay? I'm still, I like that. I'm, 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 I'm still around, you know, I'm still ticking, and, uh, but it's, it, it's great to be here. And it is, does feel a little differently because normally I'm used to being on, on your side of, uh, of this table. Uh, asking the questions and not being the one that has to answer everything. Absolutely. Well, you know, for our viewers, they know you very well, and we know your illustrious career. But let's kind of talk about when and why you decide to be a journalist. Oh, I, you know, it's it, I, it's interesting because there was uh, I don't come from a background of journalists, so I didn't really have a role model uh, growing up. Uh, I did have uh, my parents like to read, and I think that's very important. So I was really in the books all the time. So the idea of looking at a newspaper, a book, you know, came came very naturally. But it's it's funny. It's just something that I just love the idea of putting information and in news out. When I was in grade school, uh, uh, I teamed with another friend who's remained a long time uh, uh, friend. Uh, and we started in grade school. There was a thing called a mimeograph machine, which I won't even get into because <laughs> if you know what a mimeograph machine is, you're too old. But, uh, uh, you know, we put out a little publication, a few pages uh, for the, and distributed on the school playground. And I, I knew we were on to something when I saw one of the teachers looking through it with interest to see what, you know, what was going on, what were the kids reporting on. So it just went from there. In high school, I was on the paper, and in college, I was on the paper, and, uh, uh, you know, it's just been something I've, I've always done. I love the idea of bringing information and entertaining people, uh, you know, making, making uh, telling an interesting story. That's amazing that at such an early age, that's what you wanted to do. And so since I also then, wanted I wanted to be president of the United States. That, I wanted to be a firefighter. There's no surprise. I wanted to be a professional baseball player. And so just by uh, you know a, a series of uh, uh, you know deductions, eventually at elimination, it came down to well, this is something I can do. <laughs> well, but through journalism, I met you met some of the great people in all those areas and covered a variety of stories. In in all the years that you've done journalism, what's the biggest thing that you think has changed? from, don't want to date you, but from, let's say, when you started out to how journalism is done today. Well, you can date me. Uh, let's go all the way back. <laughs> let's go back 500 years. I mean, Stop. Uh, no, I, uh, seriously, um, uh, here's the point. Uh, it's interesting that uh, it was in the mid-1400s when Gutenberg, Johannes Gutenberg, invented the printing press. Hmm. And I was born about 
500 years after that event, almost, almost to the year, 500 years later. Uh, and then, of course, you know, I got into journalism, uh, uh, as I said, went, went to Northwestern University, got a, you know, majored in journalism. And, what I, and then what I've said is that in those 500 years, uh, in just the time that I've spent in my career, which is now about 50 years in journalism, that uh, the, wor the world of journalism has changed as much in that brief period of time as in the 500 years before that. Because when I first started, I mean, basically, uh, there were some, uh, obviously, improvements in the machinery, but the process of printing news and distributing it was basically the same way that Johannes Gutenberg did it. You had a printing press. You used hot metal. Uh, you didn't have computers. I, the first, uh, when I first started working, we were on a typewriter. I mean, a manual typewriter. Uh, quickly, we started getting little variations of computers, and you would code things, and it was very complicated, and you had to use whiteout and all this other stuff. But it gradually changed. And so just the mechanical process. I saw an entire industry, the typesetters unions. They were like the artisans of printing. And I saw that entire, I, and they were one of the first guilds. So they, they actually, because of Gutenberg, they, for hundreds of years, to be a, uh, a uh, typesetter, a typographer, was really a big deal. They were eliminated. Computers eliminated them. And of course, we've even seen now with newspapers the impact that it's had. So long-winded answer, uh, uh, these existential changes have dramatically changed what uh, what the newspaper business and what the, what the news media business is like. Uh, and then, of course, I think there have been some self-inflicted wounds mm -hmm. on top of all that. In other words, it would have been very hard for newspapers to survive under the best of circumstances, but I think they made some self-inflicted wounds that have lost uh, the confidence of the public so that now the public doesn't even believe what, what they're hearing anymore. Back in the 70s, more than 70% of the American people trusted news organizations. They trusted the news. Now it's probably 25%. You know, and I hear that a lot because when I first got out of college, my first job was being a journalist with a startup paper. And I had that same aspiration to help people, to help communities. And over time, more and more people are saying that it just isn't what it used to be. And you talked a little bit about the self-inflicted wound that sort of the journalism as an industry have done to ourselves. What are some of those self-inflicted wounds and? I think that uh, part of it is uh, that uh, journalists, too many journalists nowadays are pushing a narrative. Hmm. It used to be that a journalist would go in and try to be objective. We're, we're all, you know, I, I always say fairness more than objectivity, but that journalists should be fair, they should be accurate, and they should bring some perspective and knowledge to, to, to what they're doing. And uh, the fairness aspect has, uh, has kind of gone away now. Uh, in, too many, uh, in too many cases, I think journalists, as I said, they're pushing a narrative. They want the facts to fit, fit the story rather than letting the facts tell the story. Hmm. And uh, you know. That's very interesting. Now, I know you've had a long-term relationship with some of the creators of OC World, and you had envisioned, based upon what you just said, a different kind of a media, a different kind of reporting. So talk a little bit about what you had envisioned with some of the creators of OC World and where, what role you think OC World plays in journalism today. Well, I think that uh, locally focused shows like OC World, there is a great opportunity and, and a real need for it and an opportunity to thrive in this media environment. And I'll explain. The mainstream media, whether it's CNN, Fox, MSNBC, or even increasingly, and sadly to me, a lot of magazines and newspapers, are focused on a particular audience. The, 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 the economics of the business is that you have to bring in eyeballs, uh, you know, whether it's on a screen or on a, uh, on, on a computer or whatever. And so you have to kind of tailor 
uh, your news for confrontation. You have to uh, arouse people. And you know who your viewers are. So if you're MSNBC, you're going to be reporting things much differently than if you're Fox, because you know you have a different audience that's coming in uh, to see you. And I, you know, I think most people get accustomed to that, but it's kind of tiring. Hmm. It's kind of tiring. And what, what doesn't get covered is local stuff. And most people really care about local stuff. And when it comes to local news, it's not quite as confrontational. Now, each particular issue is something happening in a school board, uh, you know, some, some law that's being proposed. People will get very uh, animated and emotional about it. But it usually doesn't break along the same kind of, you know, my red team, your blue team lines. It's more like people are passionate, they're interested in it. And, uh, you know, that's where uh, the local media, I think, has a real opportunity uh, on, on a show with a nonprofit model, uh, you know, like this, where, uh, uh, you know, there's a real opportunity because people have this desire to know what's going on in their communities. But you know, you talked about there's so many ways that people get news. You've got these mainstream media, you have social media, you have a whole bunch of other ways that people are getting news. And how do we draw people into this nonprofit model, uh, public television, because everyone is streaming, everyone is getting news from Facebook. So how do we actually compete with that? And, and how do you see that challenge being overcome? Well, the way you differentiate yourself, and by the way, it, I, sh I should say, uh, you know, and the other things I said about the challenges being faced by traditional media is the fact that you do have Facebook, uh, next door app if you want to know what's going on in, in your neighborhood. There's, you know, Twitter. There's so many social media sources now that do provide a lot of the news. And, and so it's reduced the role of, or let's say narrowed the role of traditional media. But as I said earlier, people want fairness and they want, uh, uh, they, uh, they want fairness, they want insight. Uh, and, uh, you know, and those are the kinds of things that they get from, from a show like this. And, uh, you know, uh, people will weigh in with their, uh, their opinions on Twitter or the next door app or whatever. But I think they do want to say, uh, they do want to see something that's professionally done that, uh, you know, brings some perspective to it and really drills down into issues that are impact, issues uh, and uh, trends that are uh, impacting their communities. You know, and that's why we call ourselves the people's journalists, because there's so much news in the media and at times it can be so depressing and you feel helpless as a viewer. And there is enough time spent on the human stories that talk about what individuals like us are doing to make communities better. And that's what we're trying to do, is highlighting the humanity behind these social critical issues. So I, I really appreciate you being part of the visioning of OC World and being able to join us on our very first show. Well, June talking talking about uh, you know the, the 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 humanity of it. I mean you uh, uh, you have a very interesting story too, and I think you should share that with uh, with with the viewers because your background, your education is in communications, yeah. but you've had you've done some other interesting things, including being a police officer. Uh, so <laughs> tell tell us about your your journey. Well. None of this by design. Uh, I, like I said, I wanted to be a journalist since I was, ever since I could remember, and I studied it. But life takes you in certain places where I wasn't able to stay with that career because of where my family, they needed me to become basically the head of the household. And as you know, journalism starting up with a startup paper didn't quite cover the cost that's necessary. So I just started looking for a job. I actually worked for City of Pasadena as a grant administrator, helping the city educate its community and businesses about drunk, uh, driving drunk. And, and all the dangers that go with that. And it just so happened that my office was at the police department. And after about a year, uh, so many people who I respect at the police department said, hey, did you ever think about being a police officer? And I said, never, but I think you all are very smart and I'm gonna try it. 
and it's been wonderful. I did it for seven years for City of Pasadena, and I've learned so much about people and their stories, and in doing so, learned so much about myself. And I realized it's very much like journalism because you have to be investigative. You're thrown into situations where you don't have all the answers or the information, and you just have to do the best that you can to make it compelling, to make sense of it, but also to do something about it, to help those people. And even now, as the CEO of a utility agency, I see that commonality. We're in the public service, essential service. And all the things that I've learned as a journalist, as a police officer, really has brought me to this full circle, being on OC World with you, and it's, it's, it blows my mind, because all the well, things, it, yeah. well, <laughs> right? It, it, it blows my mind to hear you, uh, you know, tell your story, because now let, let's, let's back up just a little. You're a uh, you're an immigrant, yes. right? From from Korea. Yes. And by the way, uh, you speak uh, how many languages? You, uh, uh, English, obviously. Yeah, I, <laughs> I kind of uh, uh, Korean uh, and Spanish. Okay, so you are trilingual. That so you're you're two up on me, which which I say <laughs> to my great shame. But but uh, you know, so you go from journalist to police, and it's kind of like. You know, when you're giving a confess that one movie, I, I think it was uh, Moonstruck, where uh, Cher's making her confession yes. and she throws in she had an affair with her, uh, uh, you know, her, her <laughs> fiance's brother. And, and the priest says, let's stop there. Let's stop. So when you said police, I said, let's stop there. Let's talk a little <laughs> bit more about that. You're, you're how tall? 5'3". And I'm growing. And you're packing heat. You're 5'3 and you're, and you're packing heat. Yes. And, uh, what was that like? Did you get in the fights? Uh, oh, absolutely. I absolutely love what I did because it was about helping people. It's the closest thing. But it's thing. tough. It's it a tough is very job. tough. It's very scary. But I really worked at my job. I worked out. I made sure I was always on the top of my game, training myself in defensive tactics, firearms, so much so that I was actually the firearms and defensive tactics instructor. Because I know I'm small. I'm not fooling myself. But if we're going to get into a fight, we're going to go. And I will outlast you because I'm scrappy. And until the cavalry comes, I got to stay in the fight. And you got some commendation. Yes, I was involved in the shooting and I got a silver, silver medal of courage for valor under fire. Because you were, you were shot at. Yes, what happened is there was this individual who was lying in wait at a park with a hunting rifle. And he had just gotten beat up by some gang members. So he was waiting at the park, you know, he was gonna take revenge. And so when he saw me and this other officer turn the corner, he didn't know whether we were who we were. So he shot at us and it was actually very close range. And the only reason he missed was because he had his eye on the scope. And because it was so close range, he missed us, but we fired back and took him back into custody. Did you fire the shot? Yes. That, uh, uh, did he kill him? Or? No, it did not. He did not die but uh, we took him down, and yes, I did shoot. And this is where I told officers and everyone, you do what you practice, you do what you visualize, because in a moment like that, no one can prepare you. No amount of training could possibly prepare you for that kind of scenario, but it certainly helps, because it's like muscle memory, you visualize it, you prepared for it, and when that actually happens, everything else takes over. And I'm so thankful that I did take my work so seriously to prepare myself for that situation. Wow. But yeah, it taught me a lot because when you're in a situation like that, you certainly discover so much about yourself. And you know that's the beauty of what we do here is by telling these stories that people don't always hear about, but that are so impactful okay. and what it means to, as you said, uh, to, to humanity. Yeah. So I appreciate you asking me the question. Yeah, it's always I think fun to talk about that's it. That's a heck of a lot more interesting than Gutenberg. You yeah. know, but uh, <laughs> all right. So I si since so you see how I did that now. I, I love took that. Okay. I love that. Just, okay. Just to go, just to go a little more though. So that's very interesting how you transition. But then, of course, that really prepares you to become a, a government executive of a water agency. You're going to have to explain how do you go from being a police officer to suddenly running uh, a government agency. I needed to make a career change to start a family. And so I looked for all these different jobs. And the first place that called me was a water agency. And again, the, the 
per public service, essential service, all those things resonate. And I love what I do, and I encourage everyone to be open-minded as they go through life and their different career choices. And so what is it that, that you do now? I'm the CEO of a water and wastewater agency in South Orange County. We serve six cities, okay. and it's, it's a great organization. I love what I do. Now, doing a show like this, you know, you have to tackle controversial issues at times. Uh, how, uh, uh, you know, do you find, uh, how are you going to be able to remain fair and objective, and uh, how do you draw the line between your official duties and what you're doing here? Because I've always been that way. I'm more interested about why people feel the way that they do or believe what they do than trying to convince them that they should think differently. I find it fascinating. So that's the real interest mm -hmm. that I have and it fits in really well here. I certainly have my opinions, but I also want to hear other people's opinion and be able to balance and see how we might challenge our own beliefs. Yeah. So just to go back to public programming, and I grew up with it. Not everyone watches it as much as someone, perhaps like you and I. What do you think we can do as an industry to get more viewers, get more attention, to make a greater impact in our communities? Well, actually, I think when it comes to uh, uh, public television, do more of what public television has been doing. Mm -hmm. And I think rather than really focus on how, what can we do to get more eyeballs, how can we change? To some extent, that's playing into the game that I think has become a trap for too much of the media. <laughs> one, one of the problems, I think, with the, with the mainstream media is that they, to some extent, what they do has been uh, overtaken by social media. And rather than stick to being good at what they should be good at, which, as I've said, was accuracy, fairness, and insight, uh, they've decided to play that social media game, you know, and let's, uh, what are people buzzing about, so we have to buzz about it too, you know, rather than, than doing their job. And in the case of public television, he here's what I think is kind of an irony. The public television audience has stayed about the same, mm -hmm. but all of the other media are fracturing. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's much more, uh, uh, you know, uh, bifurcation and people are losing, uh, the, the major networks are losing viewers. So their pie, their slices are getting smaller while the PBS slice is staying nicely the same. Thank you very much. And I think that to a, to a great extent, people do like the civility. I, I think if there's one word that I would say that distinguishes public television from the rest, it's civility. And some people would say boring, and my answer is, that's okay. Sometimes boring is good, you know? <laughs> if, if by boring you mean we're not tearing at each other, we're not fabricating stuff, we're not, we're not hyping stuff, we're actually trying to have a civil uh, conversation among people about, you know, what's happening, I think that's good. Let others do the shouting, the screaming, let them go after the big numbers and the gotchas and all that. Let public television do what it's been doing, because I think there's a lot of people that want that, they're going to continue to want it, and maybe in time it will grow, uh, you know, as it's recognized uh, uh, by others. But I, 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 think, I think public television is, uh, ironically, good old-fashioned public television finds itself in an increasingly nice, uh, nice niche as the rest of the media world uh, becomes uh, so polarized. So I got two follow-up questions on that. You've been a long time, successful host, award-winning host of PBS. Oh, yeah. Did you conscientiously think that from the beginning over your years of career there? That's the first question. Well, like, you, what, did I want to become a famous TV person, you mean? Sure. Uh, uh, no, yeah. no, not at all, <laughs> not at all. Well, but you were very intentional in how you reported, in how you interviewed, and in how you covered topics. and. There's a little bit of fear these days that somehow if you're not on the social media train, you're not relevant. So for journalists and others who are sort of falling into that trap, as you said, mm -hmm. what advice do you have for them? Well, the, the advice I have is uh, don't do it. <laughs> you know, don't fall into that trap. Uh, what is it that, that you really want to do? What is the story you're trying to tell? You know, uh, and, and, and follow that. 
And, and in some ways, you know, if, uh, uh, again, it, you know, on social media, you can determine to a great extent what you want to be. Do you want to be an advocate? You know, are you out to advocate something? Or uh, do you want to be more of a traditional journalist where you're kind of in search of, of what's going on? You don't, you, a, a good journalist is empathetic with the issues and the people that they're covering, but they also have a certain detachment. You can't get too close. You know, you have to be detached enough where you don't lose your sense of perspective and that you can bring in other viewpoints. If that doesn't appeal to you, and sadly, I think increasingly, the, the, the kids now that are coming out of the universities don't really care about that. They, don't, uh, they want to be advocates. They've got a belief system, a story they're going to tell, and that's what they want to do. So uh, I, I don't really call that journalism. It's more advocacy. But, uh, you know, you just have to decide, uh, you know, which, which direction you want to head in. Now, something I would throw out there, and increasingly it's getting attention, but it's only been in relatively the last few months. Uh, there's a website called Substack. I don't know if you've heard of that. But that's really, uh, I think, going to be very possibly the future for a lot of journalists. Basically what it does, it's, it's like a MailChimp. Uh, it will handle everything that a journalist, uh, you know, you know if you're a journalist, you're reporting on water. You know, you're interested in water issues in California, and that's what you're writing about. You don't, you don't have to work. You, you yourself can set up your own website. You start reporting, and the deal is you charge. Typically, I think they recommend you charge five bucks a month or something like that. You don't have to charge anything if you want to do it for free. But if you want money, five bucks a month per subscriber, and Substack gets 10% of that. Okay, so they take 10%, they do everything else for you. And what that's going to do in this, in this media age, I think, it's going to give a lot of journalists an opportunity to do their thing. And if you go on Substack, it's fascinating. It's got everything. Right now, it's heavy in the, uh, uh, you know, food, food writers and things, but they've got lots of other stuff. They've got, uh, you know, uh, left and right, all different viewpoints. So what advice do you have for me? I mean, those are really good advices. Any other advice for me hosting OC World? Yeah, get better guests. Out, yeah. you know? <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> no, but I, I think this is great. You have a natural um, uh, inquisitiveness, and you have a very nice style. And uh, oh, uh, you. you know, and I, I think I, I think just just keep doing. Uh, of course, listen to Scott Hayes. You know, whatever <laughs> he tells you. Do whatever I do. Scott tells you. you know. Absolutely. He told yes. me that. That was the first thing that he yes. said I need to and do. And he told me that I should repeat that to you on, okay. on this show. But. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Rick. Thank you for joining us for an up-close and personal look into Rick Reef, Beyond the Icon. We invite you to contact us and share your thoughts about this show or future show ideas. See you again next time. Until then, from all of us at OC World, stay safe and be well. Thank you.